Hey there, this is your host, Dr. Lori Friesen, and you're listening to episode number 254 of Beginning Teacher Talk. Just because you're a beginning elementary teacher, there is no need for you to struggle like one. I'm dedicated to being the mentor for you that I wish I had when I first started teaching. In this podcast, we talk about all of the -the behind-the-scenes stuff about teaching you really need to know but didn't learn when you were in university. And we share the most amazing resources, tips, and strategies out there so you can become the teacher you've always dreamed of being. Let's start the show. Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome back to another late summer episode of the podcast. Depending on when you're listening to this, you might be getting ready already for back to school or you're starting to think about it. So I totally get this is kind of a tricky time of the year because you want to soak up that last little bit of your summer vacation, but you're also kind of got one eye back on, should I be back in my classroom? Should I be working on some things? And so I thought this was a perfect time to release an episode for you of an interview that I had with a principal. This is going to actually be a two-part series with the principal of Edens Elementary. Her name is Carrie Owens, and you are going to love Carrie. So when I first met Carrie, it was actually back in the spring of 2023 when I went to her school to surprise one of her teachers, Leah Hunt, with the $1,000 giveaway. And Carrie and I just immediately connected. I just felt a synergy with her, really loved her energy. And I said, you know, would you be interested in coming on the podcast? Because I have so many, especially new teachers or teachers who are mid-career, who are looking at a career change, who would love to hear the perspective of an administrator on what they look for when they're hiring. And Carrie was so gracious and generous. And she says, oh, yes, absolutely. I'd love to come on the podcast to talk about that. I'd be honored. And so our conversation blossomed into, well, maybe we should do a two-part series. So this is actually going to be part one of a two-part series. Today, we're going to talk about what administrators look for when they're interviewing candidates. So if you're in the middle of your job search, or if you're kind of starting to feel frustrated because you haven't landed a position yet, you are going to love this conversation today. You're going to love Carrie too. And then part two, which is going to be next week, we're going to talk about what administrators really look for once you've landed that job and you need to do observation lessons. So how you can really nail your observation lessons, how you can prepare, and what administrators are really looking for. So before we dive in and have this conversation with Carrie, I'm going to share a little bit about her. She really began her education career in 1993 in Louisiana, and she was a fourth grade teacher back then. And since that time, she has had the privilege of serving both elementary and middle school students in Louisiana and in Texas. So in 2014, she began her journey as a school administrator in Frisco, Texas. I hope I pronounced that right. And serving on elementary and middle school campuses. So since 2018, she has been a part of the McKinney School family with her first position at Wilmeth Elementary as an assistant principal. And then in 2022 to 2023 was her first principalship at Enns Elementary in McKinney. So it's so exciting. I got to meet her actually at the end of her first year. And she said on the personal side, she has graduated from LSU and Concordia Universities. And her husband, Dan, and she have three adult children who also live in Texas. She enjoys running and swimming and gardening and just about anything outdoors. And if you met Carrie in person, you would know she's just got this amazing sunshine and Energy. And I loved feeling her positivity and genuine joy at seeing one of her teachers succeeding. So it was really an honor and a privilege to meet her. I think we could be friends you know, outside of this. I just immediately really liked her. So I know you're going to enjoy getting to know Carrie today and also hearing her perspective on what she's really looking for in candidates when they get hired. And by the way, on a side note, earlier this year, in, in I think it was in May, I had Beth Bow on the podcast. Beth is a part of the Ready for School Academy, and she's also part of the Classroom Management Club, which I had no idea this was going to unfold this way, but Beth Bow is also a teacher <laughs> at the same school where Carrie's a principal, and so I met her then as well, and Beth told the story on the podcast of what it was like going through the interview process. So it's going to be so interesting getting Carrie's perspective today because Beth wasn't hired for the initial position that she interviewed for at Edens Elementary, but then Carrie circled back and hired her for the perfect position for Beth later on. So just 
a little note that if sometimes it doesn't work out exactly the way you intend, I know that after today's conversation, we're going to get a broader perspective of the principal is really looking for the person. It's not necessarily, you think you're hiring for a specific position, but that isn't always the way it plays out. And sometimes there's a grander, more appropriate, more like amazing position that's there for you that the principal can see you'd be a great fit for. So even if you're feeling discouraged, if you're in an interview and you're like, you didn't get that position, do all you can to make an amazing impression if that is the school you really want to land at, because the principal is going to be noticing you. They're going to be paying attention to you. And I'm sure after today's conversation, you're going to get more of a sense of they're hiring the person. They aren't hiring the resume. The resume is important, of course, but they really want to know a lot of things about you and the qualities that you have as a human being that will make you an amazing educator. So without further ado, let's begin our conversation and welcome Carrie Owens to the show. Well, hey there, Carrie, and welcome to the Beginning Teacher Talk podcast. I am so happy that we were able to meet here today. For those of you who don't know Carrie, we have a little bit of a history. I've already met Carrie once before in person. I immediately just really liked her and loved her energy and the way she supported her teachers. So I thought, oh my gosh, we have to have Carrie on the podcast. So Carrie, would you mind just beginning by telling us just a little bit about you and what brought you to administration in the first place? Of course. First of all, I'm super excited for the opportunity and just a a great experience for me. So thank you for um, sharing your time with me. So um, just a a quick history of um, my life in public school. Currently, I'm a principal at an elementary school in McKinney, Texas. Um, This is my ninth year in school administration. So I've served um, at an elementary campus, middle school campus, both as a teacher and as an administrator. I've been Um, in two different states, in Louisiana, Texas. The two main grades that I taught were fourth and seventh grades. Mm -hmm. Um, And an interesting little fact about me, in um, 2001, I was teaching, teaching uh, seventh grade in in Louisiana, and we were expecting our third child. And my husband and I decided that I would stay home for a while. And it was, you know, Mm -hmm. so I left my teaching career and honestly didn't, you know, really didn't know for sure that I would go back and, you know, time went by and um, my husband's job transferred us to the area where we live now in McKinney, Texas. And so I found a new way to do public school. So they do a great job just in the area that we live. I learned um, really how to truly collaborate with other teachers. I found so many supportive administrators Um, So I decided to return to public education and started off as a teacher in a neighboring district um, and finished my master's degree in 2014. And in 2019 or in 2018, I found my forever home in McKinney ISD. And so that's (laughs) where I I plan to stay planted for a very long time. So that's just a, a little bit about me. Yeah. And I was telling everybody before we actually got on our interview today that I met you in person and was at your school when I gave Leah her $1,000 for winning our contest. And it was so cool to be at your school because you could just feel the vibe of positivity and kindness and just such a good energy. And I want that experience for all new teachers, especially, I mean, it's so nerve wracking when you're starting your career, as you know, and you have to be interviewing at school. So to walk into a school and get that feeling, I was like, man, I hope I wish every new teacher would have that experience. And I know it's been a while for you, but what do you most remember about being a new teacher? It's been, I mean, probably over 20, 25 years that you've been in yes, education. It's, it's yeah. It's been a while. I'm yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Um, and just to kind of piggyback on one comment that you made just about the energy yeah. coming into the campus where I currently serve. Um, I appreciate you saying that. It's just, it's real important. And I will say um, that energy, it really starts, hopefully it starts in the parking lot as you pull mm-hmm. in and you see that front door curb appeal. It matters, with yeah. you, but it also matters with a, a business or a school, a campus. So look yeah. for that as you're going to um, interview at different campuses, different schools, mm-hmm. and then it it continues as you come into that front office. So yes. working, you know, part of uh, what we've done, and it's been a history here at the campus where I'm serving, but 
um, our front office people. I mean, they know how to greet people, make sure people feel welcome, taken care of. So that's, yeah. you look for that vibe, look for that energy, just as soon as you, you know, you walk in that building. But um, so back to your question, I can remember being a first year teacher. It was a long time ago, but yeah, just the, you know, the excitement when you realize that a student gets it. It's that yes. little moment, you know, when you realize whether you're teaching reading or math and you know that they've made that connection to some bit of learning, whether it's small or, or big, whatever, that doesn't even really matter. But the cool mm-hmm. thing is you realize that you played a part in that student's learning. And so it's a, I kind of get a little bit of chills just thinking about it now, but the, yep. you know, there's the smile, those bright eyes, you just know it when they know it and, and you get to celebrate with that student. So it's exciting. And it's addicting, right? Because once yeah. it's happened once, you're like, how do I do that again? How do I do that again and again? And as hard as our jobs are as educators, that is one of the things that always brings teachers back because as challenging, I mean, of course our jobs are challenging. The thing that keeps, that kept me in education all those years and was so hard for me to leave the classroom was that very feeling of, you just don't get that anywhere else. That, that real immediate feedback of making an yeah. impact. It's yeah. just, it's really cool. Especially when they're younger, you think, man, we've set them up on a trajectory here. Yeah. Um, amazing things. Yeah. And it matters. I mean, you have to remember at the, ele- well, most elementary schools there, you, you have six years you know, yeah. to build relationships with those kids. And it's yeah. huge. I mean, it's a huge growth time and, and you get to play a part in that. It's, it's a magical experience most of the time. And one of the huge benefits of having been in education for quite a while is that we are able, we have the ability of perspective or the gift of perspective to be able to look back. And I know I stressed out on about so many things as a new teacher that now I look back on and I think, hmm, I wonder if I'd put my energy on different things, if it would have been more helpful. So if you could give your younger self one piece of advice about when you first started teaching, what would you tell her? Well, and I was, you know, I know some teachers come into education, um, you know, into teaching, you know, maybe at a later point in their life or whatever, but I was still, I was still in my twenties when I started teaching. And so especially in my first school, I was at a middle school. And so of course, parents are a lot older than I am. So that was the biggest hurdle was not being afraid of parents Mm -hmm. and realizing that we're on the same side, we have the same goal. And that's to help their student, help their child. And so yeah. that communication piece, knowing that parents really do want to partner with you. So don't be afraid to share with, you know, parents what, what's going on with their with their student. And it's so much better if you can start the year on a positive note, yeah. try really hard to work into your schedule, maybe the first grading period, whether it's six or nine weeks, just pick up the phone and make a quick positive phone call to that parent and say, Hey, I've got two minutes, wanted to share, you know, share what Mm -hmm. little Susie did today. And it's, you know, just a positive piece. So make those deposits early on, just as you build that relationship with parents, because you're doing that, doing that with your students, but you're also building relationships and trust with those parents. So take time to, to do that. Yeah. And I love what you said about the phone call because in our increasingly busy world, I mean, it's just, we are used to texting, but to pick up the phone and take that couple of minutes to call a parent means the world even more so probably than we first started teaching in today's world, because that is something that we don't do as often. We don't hear each other's voices enough. We, we just text and a lot of miscommunication can happen through text as well. So I love that also, because I teach that as well in the ready for school Academy. I always tell them, you know, in that first few weeks of school, the positive phone call home sets the tone. And Mm -hmm. once they've heard your voice and the other thing I loved about what you said was I had the same fear of, of parents, you know, when I first started to, cause I was much younger, but because I think we put that pressure on ourselves to be the expert all of a sudden, cause we are now graduated. We're the full-time teacher. We feel like we need to be the expert, but repositioning that to, we are actually in partnership here. We have your child's best interests at heart and they are experts on their children as much as we are experts in education. We're not experts, but as much as we know in education. Um, And so I really do love that you've said that about being partners in education because it does set the tone. It really does. So, yeah. Now, sorry, go ahead. One other just quick thing, just, you know, when you make that phone call, you then, it's a two-way communication more so. 
you have the opportunity to listen, you know, really yes. pause and listen to that parent, you know, maybe they're, I mean, maybe you've, you know, you're well into the school year. Maybe there's that conversation you have to make, you know, about an academic struggle or a behavior struggle. And then you get the opportunity to pause and really listen to the parent, even yeah. if it seems like they're a little bit angry or frustrated. It's really not directed at you. It's, mm-hmm. you know, your chance to really dig deep in that, that communication by listening and knowing that there's more to the story and you yeah. can get from the parent. And there's so much going on on people's lives outside of our bubble in the classroom. And sometimes it's easy to misconstrue that, like you said, that it's all about us and what we are interaction with the child. But there may be lots of things going on in that family's life that is causing extra stress and extra problems. And that's why the homework isn't getting done. And that's why the child is distracted. So, yes, that just listening, taking the time to say, is there something I need to know about? Is there something that I can help with is such valuable advice. Now, one of the other stressful things, and we're here to talk about this today, especially is as a new teacher, landing that first job and interviewing can be so stressful for new teachers. And we've talked about interviewing several times on the podcast before, but as an administrator, we want to hear your perspective about what are kind of the five things that you're really looking for when you're interviewing a prospective candidate for your school. Okay. Those are, that's a a really good topic. So one thing, probably the most important that we're actually, I'll just have to say two, I'm going to tell you five, but these are, okay. for yeah. me, these are the top two. The first one is, is this candidate approachable? Mm-hmm. Do they, um, you know, do they feel like that, or does it seem like they can connect with the group? So oftentimes, you know, or really every time you'll have preset interview questions, all those are the same for every candidate, but usually I will just put my pen down at a certain point and I'll just look at the candidate and just watch and make that eye contact and look and see, you know, does that person make eye contact? Does they, you know, are they trying to smile? And I know that it's, you know, you get nervous and I've been there, I've been in that interview and I yeah. know the nerves, but it, if you can practice just that piece of it, before your interviews begin, mm-hmm. just being relaxed, being approachable, making that eye contact and, you know, a friendly smile or a pleasant look on your face. And then the second thing, I hope this doesn't sound silly, but is it really, really apparent that this candidate likes children? Yes. That's so important. (laughs) I I, honestly have left an interview and I've wondered that. Yes. Because I think everyone goes into teaching for different reasons. And it might be that we we really like the idea of the schedule. We might really like certain aspects of it, but that is the key to staying in this profession long-term and to your happiness and joy. And along the way is if you really love kids. And I love that you brought that up because if you really love kids, even the hardest kids Mm -hmm. are worth your time because you love them. You know that they are valuable, that they need your help. And you, you see past all the behaviors and the challenges when you really love them. So tell me more about that. Well, and so, and that's an excellent point because if um, you've got to remember that you've got to make the connection before the content, and of course, knowing your content and and your teaching objectives, all of that is, you know, really important, but making connections first, make building those relationships and getting to know kids, getting to know parents, it, it will bring, it will pull you into your career, into that job. And you will, you won't be able to help, but just love kids. And so even though maybe the candidate, you know, is a, you know, maybe they don't actually have, you know, teaching experience in the classroom, but I look for those examples of how they, maybe it's with nieces and nephews, or maybe it's with, right. certain, you know, in their community or during their student teaching experience, but look for those ways that that candidate connected with kids. Maybe it's with attending some extracurricular function. Yeah. Maybe it was, you know, you sit down and ask questions, getting, you know, getting to know the students. So mm-hmm. just making sure that they have had at least a few experiences where they've been conscious about developing that relationship with kids. And isn't it interesting when you think of some of your very best teachers, I always notice when there's a room full of people, if you've got a few teachers and kids walk in, if they get instantly get focused on the kids, you know, they're really kid focused. And I just love it. They start the conversations with the kids. They can't help but connect with them and want to get to know them. 
you know, those are shining stars. They are people who genuinely love kids. So, and I, by the way, I want to know if you've been listening to my podcast for the last three years, because I'm telling you everything that you've said until now has been said on my podcast at some I point. Love it. so cool. <laughs> well, you I, mean, know I knew I liked you, but now I, I really it. like you. <laughs> we are kindred spirits. I just feel yes. that. I know that. I, I felt that it. too. It's so interesting, right? So, it. so many layers of you that I'm just learning to love. So tell me more. You've told me the first two. Okay. The first one was, is this person approachable? The second was, is this, does this candidate truly love children? Okay. What's the third? Okay. So third one. So how does this candidate demonstrate that he or she can work with a team of adults? Oh, there it is. Because, there yes. again, <laughs> because that in my current role as a, a campus principal, and I love it, love my job, love my school, my, my school district. Um, but oftentimes it is the adults in the building that make it, you know, it the is most challenging. challenging, you know? Mm -hmm. And I love my teachers, love them to pieces, but it is, it's hard because the work is hard, yeah. um, you know, getting along well with other people because there will be conflict, there will be stress. Yeah. So what does that look like um, for that candidate when they've encountered a group of adults, whether, yeah. you know, maybe their student teaching experience or on a team of adults, obviously, how did they work through conflict? How did they work through stress? Um, and how did they process that? Yes. Um, you know, listening to other people's perspective and working hard to meet in the middle, realizing that sometimes you have to agree to disagree mm -hmm. and you come to a, a mutual understanding and, and you just move on because it does go back to serving kids yes. and students can, it doesn't matter if they're five or 15, they can pick up on stress yes. and conflict among adults. And so that can't be displayed and shown, you know, in front of children. And so have they had that experience of working through that? Yeah. And it's so interesting that you bring that up because I think COVID really disrupted our lives in so many, on so many levels. I mean, we've, we've seen the impact on a lot of children who've had to stay at home for a couple of years. They didn't get that, that daily training and conflict resolution, that those daily practices and opportunities to learn how to resolve conflicts peacefully with each other and, you know, take responsibility for their actions. And now we're feeling the results of that and needing even more really targeted social and emotional learning for kids. But I think also adults have suffered. I mean, I think all that time being isolated on our own, I'm seeing a lot more challenges with teachers learning to play with each other, like if, for lack of a better term, but it's almost like we have less patience with each other. And I think we need to relearn kindness and compassion for each other's perspectives and viewpoints. So I love that you bring that up. We just talked about this inside my, I have a, a membership called the classroom management club. And we talked about how it seems like the most challenging relationships in teaching are actually the other adults, mm -hmm. you know, kids are challenging, but if you don't have the, the other team members to fall back on and supportive administration, when there is a real challenge in your classroom, that can be the make or break point for a lot of teachers. So that collaboration, I agree, is so important. And I like it. You pointed that out about um, seeking administration. So, yes, I mean, most yeah. of the time, you know, teachers, maybe it's a third grade team, they can work out the conflict, they get through the, you know, those points of disagreement and they move on past it. But sometimes, hopefully, yeah. you know, you, you have the experience or you have the environment where you can reach out to your administration to come in as a yeah. neutral third party. And let's say, you know, let's work through this together. So it's, it is hard, but keeping the main thing, the main thing, and that yeah. being loving on kids and supporting kids in their growth. If you and keep the, that at the forefront. Yes. And a little side note, as you were speaking, I was thinking uh, you talked about how it all begins at the front door of your school. If you start getting, and I really am a big intuitive person. If you start getting red flags, when you're interviewing with an administrator, if you start feeling like this is not a I don't want to say it's not a safe place, but if you start getting feelings of, I'm not sure I feel comfortable here. I'm not sure I'd be supported here. Pay attention to that because listen to what Carrie is saying right now. How do you feel when you're hearing her speak? That is the vibe at her school. And that is the vibe I want for you. So please like pay attention to that. Take care of yourself. Um, too many teachers accept positions when they knew it wasn't right, when they knew it maybe didn't feel like a good fit. So the questions that Carrie is asking that what she's focused on right now, these are important things to be focused on. If your administrator is focused on things that don't feel important to you and that feel like not a good fit for you, pay attention to that. So yeah. thank you, Carrie, for bringing this up. All right. What is the fourth thing you're looking for in these candidates? 
Number four, does the candidate have a growth mindset? And mm -hmm. so this is, I mean, this could really touch on each of the ones that I'm sharing. Yep. I'm thinking mostly about um, you're going to have a challenging student. You will. Yep. You yep. will your first year. You'll at least one. <laughs> at least one. And maybe yep. it's, you know, academic challenges or maybe it's behavioral challenges. But knowing that you are their person and you are not giving up. Yes. You're going to pull out all the tips and tricks and tools in your tool bag. You're going to reach for an instructional coach for support, maybe an administrator. You're yep. going to, you know, send up the flag of, you know, I need yep. help, you know, be able yes. to meet this kid's needs because it's our job as the adult to meet the kid where their need is. It's not the student's job to come meet us where our needs are. And, and sometimes, I mean, I've, I'll be honest. I mean, as a, you know, as a new teacher, I can remember thinking, well, you know, why doesn't this kid do this or do that? Yep. They're the student, they're the child and I'm the adult. And so just remembering that, that it, it's, it's our work, it's our job, it's hard work, but it's worth it. And if you start with, and I'll, I'll say this probably with nearly every response, it goes back to building that relationship with that student Yes. first and foremost. So connection before content, you've got to get that going. Um, and realizing that, you know, some, you know, maybe it's um, some differentiated instruction you need to pull out. Maybe it's mm -hmm. a different type of an assessment tool. Um, maybe you need to tweak your progress monitoring to figure yeah. out you know, what is the next best step. But, you know, reaching out if you need support for meeting that student's needs and don't let it get too far away from you. You know, yes. I want to see growth with this student, whether it's behavior, academic. I need to see growth you know, I'm looking at a week, I'm looking at a month. And if you're not seeing that, then reach out and get the help that you need. You said so many important things there, but the one that really got my attention was when you said connection before content. And I think that that is the piece that we gloss over too quickly at the beginning of the year too often, at least I was guilty of this in the beginning, because I was so concerned about getting to the standards and covering the curriculum and making sure. And I didn't really know how to build connections with kids. I think that's the other piece that I think sometimes we gloss over. So those of you who are listening, if you didn't hear the previous two episodes, I go in deep about five ways that you can really connect with kids. Um, uh, this episode is coming out in August. So five deep ways that you can connect with kids at the beginning of the year to build those relationships and build trust. And then I really hope you listen to part four of my classroom management series, where I tell the story about remembering Austin. You have to go back and listen to that because everything that Carrie just said, what she's looking for in a candidate is all built around that connection with kids. The moment you care, the moment they know you care, you've made that connection with them, you will start to see growth. It may not be the growth that you want. It may not be at the level that you want, the pace you want, but two things that Carrie said, first, that connection before content. And secondly, ask for help, ask for help. Love that. Perfect. So the growth mindset and then number five, what is your fifth main? Number five, and it kind of wraps everything up. Um, again, I feel like this is a little, is woven into each one of my responses mm -hmm. I've shared thus far, but um, the communication piece of it, relationships are, are first and foremost, but then mm -hmm. being able to communicate well. And, you know, I mentioned, you know, communicate through the conflict, through the stressful times, but think about yourself in that interview time, you have just really a short window of time, maybe it's 30 minutes, maybe, maybe 45 minutes, but how, and it sounds silly, but how are you sitting at the table? What is your body language? Are you, you know, mm -hmm. sitting there like, you know, not silly at all. Stuff. You're not, I mean, you just think yeah. about your hands, think about yeah. your, your nonverbal language. Mm -hmm. And um, it could even be that maybe you have a partner that interviews you and you practice that, record yourself, you know, see how you look. Yes. See how you're coming high. across. <laughs> yeah. Are you smiling at all? Or do you look like yes. you're in front and of a train? <laughs> yeah. And it's, you yeah. know, you could have a heart of gold and you love kids and all that, but you just get that one first impression. And, and yeah. I want you to do well, I know, yes. you know, and you want to do well. So think about, you know, that nonverbal language, the, you know, the, the smile, the, you know, the eye contact is a big thing. And if you when I, in an interview, sometimes I, I'm guilty of, I start talking really fast because I'm thinking, yeah. okay, let me hurry up and get this over with. Yes. But taking time, remind yourself to pause, remind yourself to take a breath and that's okay. Mm -hmm. I really like it actually when I see a person 
you know, you ask the question and the candidate just takes a breath, they pause, maybe they jot down a little note or two. That's okay. That yes. is okay. Mm-hmm. So take that time to really let your your heart and your energy really shine. And that's, I think, a lot of the ways it's done through, you know, your nonverbal cues. Yeah, that comfort and that willingness to think and be thoughtful in your responses. Yeah. I love that. It, it is really a good point. When you think about when you're in an interview, you often look and feel and sound different than you would normally. It's hard to relax and to be present. And there's sometimes common questions that really trick like trip up a lot of interviewers because, or interviewees, because you're so nervous and you're like, wait a minute. So what are some of the things that are maybe if you could pick three questions that really trip new teachers up in interviews, especially when the nerves hit and they're like, oh my gosh, like, I'm not even sure how to answer this. How, what, what three questions do you see them mess up and how can they kind of prepare for that? Okay. That's, I love that question. So this is one that I can't, I'm almost every time someone will say, oh, you know, they'll pause and they'll be taken back a little bit. They'll say, oh, well, that's a good question. Yeah. So, here it is. So how would children describe you? I love that question. Why, Why would they describe you that way? So uh-huh. it's, and, you know, they typically, you know, well, I'll just say what I, I love to hear. I mean, really going back to the, the, the most recent things we just discussed, but if, you know, a, a t- or if a candidate can say, you know, children would say that I'm friendly. Mm-hmm. Children would say that I really like them. I mean, those yes. you know, real personal, those soft skills yep. and, and knowing that um, children can see that. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. they, they feel can, that they can catch a phony really, really fast. Yep, they can. <laughs> they know if you don't like them. And it's very heartbreaking when I'll hear a child say to me, oh, well, miss or miss so-and-so just, they don't like me. And yeah. Yeah. So that's an excellent question. Yeah. How do you think that a child would see you through their eyes and what would they, what would they say about you? And then follow it up with why, why would they say that? So Mm -hmm. that's a good question. And then, um, I typically will give a a candidate a little bit of a heads up and say, think about what was your best lesson. So I, I like for a person to be able to think about that a little bit before, instead of just springing that, you know, springing it on them in the interview. So Mm-hmm. share with us your best lesson and then what made it the best lesson. Awesome. So yeah. I'm looking for student engagement, looking for, you know, hands-on learning and, you know, the engagement was connected to the objective. And then I could assess and see that we met the objective based on the assessment. So, yes. Can you give your perspective on portfolios? Do you like teachers to bring portfolios in or what is your thought on that? I, I do as long as, I mean, of course, we're not going to go, you know, page to page because as I said previously, usually right. you know, it was 30 minutes, 45 minutes. And if I like to be able to look at a, a candidate's face and be able to kind of feel their energy. And if we yep. get too deep into looking at a binder or maybe it's, you know, digital or whatever, but screen after screen or page after page, it takes me away from being able to connect with that person. So right. It's, I like it, especially if I've, you know, given them the heads up about, you know, bring in your best lesson. So maybe they have yeah. some artifacts that they really want to share yes. and that's a good thing to do. But mm-hmm. as long as it's not going to take up more than, you know, four or five minutes looking yeah, at used as a tool to answer questions. Yeah. Not yeah. the main focus of the interview. Yeah. A lot of teachers say to me, well, I don't, nobody even asked to see my portfolio. And I say, well, that isn't the reason you bring your portfolio. You bring it so that you can show, not tell. If yeah. there's a question that they ask and they want to see something that you've done, well, you can show them. But yeah, they they get frustrated because they're like, I've put all this work into this and nobody even asked to see it. And I think, and I always say to them, well, it's actually not the principal's job to ask you, you know, to, to see your portfolio. They don't care about your scrapbook. They want to know about you and how this can support what you're doing in the, like for kids. So, and I love that. I would love it if, and I, that's a good point. So if, if you have your portfolio, whether it's, you know, physical or, or digital or digital, um, maybe there's a certain question that's asked and you're like, Oh, Hey, you know, this is my opportunity to show and not just tell. Yeah. So that would be a great, so just as it, as it, a uh, you know, a natural, it's just happening, happening organically to bring that in. I like yeah, that. That makes sense. And what was the third question that you would commonly see being tripped up? 
Well, it goes back to those connections or the, you know, working through stress with, you know, within a team, within an adult mm-hmm. team. So share a time that you played a significant role in resolving conflict among yes. a group of adults. And maybe, I mean, this could even be a family example, or it could be, you yep. know, in college, you know, your sorority sisters or, or fraternity brothers or, or whatever, but um, how you played a significant role in helping to resolve that conflict. Yes. We talk about this so often with kids, but it is just as, and if not more important, when you're working with a team of adults. If we don't know how to do this ourselves, how do we teach children conflict resolution skills? So I love that you're asking that question. Yeah. Exactly. I know we can do it. We can coach kids. You know, you coach a group of kids and give them some strategies and, and things to try, but then using that for ourselves to <laughs> those <conflict> yes. <laughs> and strategies. It gets harder when it becomes, you know, real personal with the people you're working with every day. So yeah, practice what we, what we teach, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's harder. Yes. Yeah. So we've talked about so many great pieces of advice for teachers who are in the interview process, but if you could leave us with one piece of advice in terms of how to help teachers prepare for interviews, what would you say? And I've mentioned this once or twice, but just the the actual, you know, the interview itself, those nonverbal skills, I mean, work with a mentor, maybe work with, um, you know, with a, a, a friend of yours, someone that can um, give you some feedback just on your physical presence, your emotional presence within that interview setting, you know, throw some questions at you, just see how you respond to that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think even more important than that is think about, um, think about your story. Why, why do you even want to do this? What is your why? So piece that together for yourself in your mind and in your heart, know your why and be able to tell your story and articulate that. Hopefully it goes back Mm -hmm. to, you know, connections with kids and, you know, starts there, but what were those little milestones along the way? that help you really solidify, this is my why, this is yep. why I'm going into education for kids. And so, mm-hmm. you know, be able to put the heart and the words to that. And yeah. that is not something that when you go into an interview, you're not going to say, well, Hey, let me tell you my story. Here's my why you're right. going to think about there are four or five key pieces. And I'm going to weave that in so yes. that that interview team, they know my heart, they know my why. Yes. You look for those organic opportunities to weave that in. I love this advice. And I've really enjoyed this entire conversation, mostly because I think of the absence of certain things that we have not mentioned, and they're just as important, but really the, the focus of our entire conversation, and this is something I talk about all the time as well, is this is a heart-centered profession. This is, we are dealing with tiny humans, and we are dealing with little ones who are just trying to find their way. And that is the job. That is the bottom line is, do you love kids? And are you able to work with children and adults in a way that is going to be heart centered? And so, of course, data is important. Of course, assessments are important. Of course, benchmarks are important. But I want everyone who's listening to realize that has not been the focus of our conversation today. That is not the focus when you're working with children. What I love about Carrie is she is so clear in her intention in terms of this is what's most important. And so if you're getting again messages from people who you're interviewing with and all they're asking you is how will you meet the benchmarks? How will you Of course, those are important questions. Of course, that will come up. But the main intention here is what their principals are really looking for is do you love kids? Is this your heart's calling? Will you be in this for the long term? And at the bot, when the chips are down and things are hard, will you stick it out for your kids? So I just so appreciate you coming onto the podcast today, Carrie. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us. Thank you, Lori. So there you have it. I hope that that was super helpful for you, especially if you're in the interview process and you're trying to land that dream job. I really hope that Carrie's advice resonated with you and that you are feeling some relief and some support and knowing that really administrators want you to excel. They want you to do well. And I hope you've taken her advice to heart because 
Kerry is a fantastic administrator, but there are so many good schools out there and I really want you to have a great experience. Pay attention to your intuition and pay attention to how you're feeling as you're getting interviewed because although they're interviewing you, you're also interviewing for a position where you're going to be spending every single day. So you need to feel good about where you're going to be. All right. If you'd like a little bit of extra help preparing for interviews, I have a great freebie for you. It's called 24 Interview Prep Cards, where I've really taken 24 of the most common questions new teachers get asked during the interview process. You can download these, print these, and then write your bullet point answers so you can practice in advance and feel a lot more confident and relaxed as you walk into those interviews. All right, my friends, I hope that you have a wonderful week. Next week, we're going to be welcoming Carrie back to the podcast again for part two, where we're going to talk about what administrators are looking for during observation lessons. So once you land that job, what are the things that principals are really looking for when they come into your classroom to observe and how can you best prepare for observation lessons? So that's coming up for you next week. Have a wonderful rest of your week. And until next time, remember, just because you're a beginning elementary teacher, there's no need for you to struggle like one. Bye for now.